Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for being here today. And before I start, a quick question. How many of you were there for the Narsi Jutadarshi class that I gave two days ago on Friday? Okay, a few of you. Thank you. So as was mentioned, we will have a quick question, a question answer session towards the second half of this class. I'll speak today on the topic of how to be consistent in our life. Can how to be consistent. For all of us, we have moods within us. Sometimes the same thing, which I feel, I love doing this. And a couple of days later, why did I ever start doing this at all? Uh, our moods are very powerful. Sometimes two people, they get so attracted to each other. They say to the world, I can't live without this person. And then a few months later, I can't live with this person. <laughs> so, our moods can make us toss about like small leaves in an ocean. And of course, our moods are not the only obstacles. The world also brings in difficulties. And therefore, it becomes difficult, very difficult to stay consistent in doing something. So I'll talk about consistency broadly in three parts. I'll use an acronym AIR, A -I -R, of how to be consistent. So A is association. We are innately social creatures. And social creatures means that what people around us do shapes what we do. Say all of you are sitting here right now and all of you are reasonably confident that the person next to you is not going to turn at you and slap you in the face. And now, you could say theoretically there is a possibility but the probability is very low. Why? Because we are like-minded people who have come here to learn something spiritual. So the point I am making is that our own mind can come up with hundreds of desires, ideas, but the social circle around us, it determines to some extent which ideas or thoughts or desires we express and which we restrain. So if we want to do anything constructive in life, choosing our association is very important. Our moods are not in our control. Sometimes we will feel like doing something, something, sometimes we will not at all feel like doing it. But if we have people around us who stimulate our healthy desires, who stimulate our noble aspirations, who stimulate our uplifting resolutions, then even if we are not, don't feel like doing it, still those around us will trigger that desire, will activate that desire within us. Whenever we do anything, when we talk about consistency, what do we mean? That there is something which we want to do, but either because of an outer obstacle or because of an inner mood, we, don't, we no longer feel driven to do it. So how do we get that desire to keep doing it? We might decide, I want to study some wisdom text like the Bhagavad Gita. We start it, we read it for some time, and then we put it aside. So, Srila Prabhupada has written Bhagavad Gita as it is. And many people take Bhagavad Gita as it is and keep it as it is. <laughs> you just don't read it. So, what happens is that the desire doesn't get stimulated. So, to understand how association can help us persevere in our healthy desires, we can understand that our desires are not just linear. Our desires are triangular. Now what do we mean by say, triangular desires? A linear desire is, say, we see something and then we desire it. Now suppose after this program, there is Prasad. Well, no suppose, Prasad is there, don't worry. <laughs> but suppose there is some special delicacy which you have never heard of. 
Have any of you heard of baklava? Baklava? Okay, some of you. Not many of you not heard of it. Anyone never heard of baklava? Okay. So a few years ago, I was also in this category. Baklava is basically an Arabian sweet dish. So I had gone to Australia and I was at one devotee's house and he told me that I have, we have made baklava as dessert. Would you like to have it? Now, now the name baklava doesn't sound very pleasant. Is it? I said, mm, maybe later. And they brought the plate, in the, brought the dish in front of me. I said, later. But there's another friend who had come with me to, the, uh, to their ho the, the house for food. I said, yeah, give me. And then he took it and he was eating it. You could, if you could have something like uh, a samadhi through the tongue, it was absorbed. I thought, I thought it's so delicious. Just give me, a, give me a little bit also. So what happened over there? The seeing it did not create the desire, but seeing someone enjoying it created the desire. So desire is not just linear. By our looking at an object, the desire comes, but desire is also triangular. That means we see somebody else doing it and seeing how they are doing it, how they are relishing it, that creates desire within us. And this is what the principle that many companies, when they advertise their products, they use endorsements. Many sports stars and movie stars, often they earn more through the endorsement than to actual sports and movies. So what does the endorsement basically mean? Okay, this new cell phone has come. Now, so many new cell phones keep coming. But if some celebrity endorses that, then people say, oh, the celebrity is using it, I want to use it. So basically, our desires are not just linear, but also triangular. And that principle, we can apply for sticking to our resolutions and becoming consistent. We desire, decide to do something. Say, I'll read Bhagavad Gita, I will do this exercise. I will regulate this, whatever it is we want to do. I want to meditate regularly. Now, now suppose, say, if you want to study some wisdom text. Now, we just look at the Bhagavad Gita. For some people, it might be very, look very attractive. I want to read it. But for most people, oh, it's such a big book. There are so many books in the world. What is the point of reading it? Maybe sometime I'll read it. So just looking at it may not create the desire. But if you associate with someone who reads the Bhagavad Gita regularly, who relishes the Gita, who shares wisdom from the Gita and they are alive with the Gita's wisdom. Then we start thinking, hey, really? There is so much wisdom, so much insight, so much taste in the Gita. What is there? I want to find out. So, we may not get the desire to read a uh, wisdom text, but seeing somebody reading and relishing it will create our desire. So, if we find ourselves being inconsistent in something, what we can do is, we can't change our moods but we can change our association to some extent and try to have some people around us who are consistent in doing something. And even if we don't feel like doing it, by looking at them, we will get the desire. So if we want to have a more regulated lifestyle when we wake up, sleep on time, wake up on time, then what happens for us is, if we make a resolution, I'll wake up early in the morning. We make that resolution, but when the alarm rings, something within us is, go to sleep. And among all the buttons on our clock, the button that we use most often is the snooze button. <laughs> snooze, snooze, snooze. So, but if say we have a friend and we both decided we'll wake up and they give us a phone call or they send a message and they say, oh, let's wake up and we wake up. They might be somewhere else, but they could, but basically whatever it is you want to do, if we have association, that brings a certain level of consistency. And the programs like this, where we come to have like-minded association. This is very valuable for kindling and strengthening our spiritual desires. So if we can just be consistent in associating with someone who is doing something consistently, then automatically some consistency will rub into us. We might not, not ourselves be consistent in doing that thing, but you can just try to be, try to associate regularly with somebody who is consistent. So that is the first point. What is the acronym I am using? Does anyone remember? Air. So A was association. 
then I is intelligence. So intelligence means what? That for all of us, we have inside us a mind and an intelligence. So the Bhagavad Gita offers a three level model of the self. There is the body, there is the mind and the soul. So now at the subtle level, intermediate level, there is the mind and the intelligence. So the mind is like a, like a child and the intelligence is meant to be like an adult. So with the intelligence, we can persevere even when we don't feel like doing something. So consistent, if, if we rely only on our feelings, we will never be consistent about anything. But with our intelligence, another thing related with the eyes, with our intelligence, we can solidify our intention. Intention means, what do I want to do? Is what I want to do and what I feel like doing. The two may not always be the same. And in this case, it's important to understand that, that say, if we're trying to do something spiritual, say, if we're trying to meditate, we're trying to chant the Hare Krishna mantra, and we're trying to concentrate, but we're not able to concentrate. We are not even able to feel like, feel like doing it. But our feelings are not always in our control. But our intention can be in our control. It's like, say, some of you might be feeling cold right now. Now, feeling cold is simply a physical reaction to an external situation. If the temperature is, if your body is temperature sensitive, you can't bear a particular amount of cold, naturally you'll feel cold. So, just as there are physical reactions to events, there can also be psychological reactions to events. And when, the, so now, even if you're feeling cold, you may decide, okay, this class is important, it's cold, but I can tolerate it for maybe next half an hour. Or you might decide, maybe I'll just shift a little bit over here. Or if you have some cloth, you put it on. But if your intention is strong, you'll adjust. You have the sensation of cold, but you persevere. So similarly for us, with our intelligence, we understand that our emotion, what we feel, is simply a psychological reaction to a situation. But that doesn't necessarily alone have to determine what we do. I might feel cold, but if I have to do something important, I might still do something important that cold. So similarly, I may feel bored, I may feel lethargic, but still, if this is important, I will do it. So we need to differentiate between our emotion and our intention. Our emotion is something which just automatically comes, but our intention is what we choose. So emotion comes, we acknowledge the emotion, we don't deny it, we don't suppress it. We don't have to say, I don't want to, uh, why should I feel like this? I don't want to feel like this. Okay, I don't want to feel like this, but I'm feeling like this. What do I do? I persevere. Now, one important point with respect to this intelligence and intention to understand is that all of us, we get some urges. When the, when the urges come, like the urge of anger, the urge of greed, the urge of envy, the urge of lust, all these come up and they push us to do something which you would normally not do. At that time, what do we do? So if we think, oh, I am getting angry, I am getting, and this envy is coming, lust is coming, greed is coming. At that time, if we see this, this emotion is just some stimulation that is happening in my mind. But I am different from it. That stimulation may rise, it may rise, 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 we sometimes think that it will keep rising. I'm feeling angry, I'll feel angrier, and I'll feel angrier still, and I'll feel angrier still. Better let me explode now. No. But these moods that come upon us, these moods are cyclic. They rise and they go down also. So with our intelligence, we, if we maintain our intention, yes, this mood is coming, I'm feeling bored right now, but I won't be feeling like this forever. It will come, it will go. So it's like a, whatever makes us inconsistent, whatever breaks our consistency, the, the unhealthy moods, unhealthy urges, we can see them like waves. Okay, right now this is rising. It's a surge in the urge. But the surge will not last forever. Have any of you played arm wrestling matches with anyone? Has anyone played arm wrestling? Some of you, yes. Thank you. 
Now, suppose you are playing an arm wrestling match with someone who is much stronger than you. And they've got your arm right down. Now, if the arm comes close to the, close to the ground or the table, you may say, hey, this person is so strong, I can't resist. We we'll just give up. And although we could resist a little longer, but we'll think, what is the point? Ultimately, they're going to just beat me down. But if we knew that this arm wrestling match is of timed rounds, and each round is of three minutes, then, although they may have got my hand right to the surface, but if I have to resist it only for three minutes, and it's, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if you can just survive the present round, then we will resume on neutral ground. We won't resume over here. We'll resume over here again. So the point I'm making here is that with our intelligence, if we maintain our intention, then whatever unfavorable, unhealthy mood is coming, it's it's not going to be it's not going to last forever. It's a wave. It'll rise, it'll decrease. It's like a timed arm wrestling match. We don't have to, we don't have, we don't have to think that I'll have to keep resisting this for the rest of my lifetime. No, everything is temporary. Even our moods are temporary. So we can pray to Krishna, Krishna, I don't want to feel like this. I, I somehow this feeling is coming on me, but still I want to serve you. I want to do the right thing. Please give me strength. We just maintain that intention using our intelligence. So what will happen is, we will ride through that wave. We will, instead of getting swept away by that wave, we can surf that wave. That wave rises, we feel it rising, and then it decreases. The Bhagavad Gita talks about association, as well as it talks about this kind of intelligent intention. It says in 14.22 and 23, that uh, when Prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava Nadveshti sam pravrittani na nivrittani kaangshati Udhasina vadasina munayyona vichayate Gunavartan tityeva yobatishthati nengate Krishna says just stay detached, observe. Observe the urge rising, it will rise, 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 it will go down. So, that's how we can maintain our Consistency with intelligence and intention. So with our intelligence, we understand this is temporary. It's like a child who's going through moods, but let me be like an adult. And it's a time arm wrestling match. So let me just bear it for this one round. So that was I. What was the last one? R. So here is the acronym. A was association. I is intelligence and intention. So intelligence, sustaining our intention and intelligence. Now, R is recollection. What do I mean by recollection? So recollection means that when we are going through dry phases in our life, dry phases means we just don't feel like doing anything. Sometimes we wake up in the morning and we may not feel like getting out of bed only. Just feel, oh, life is so terrible. I just don't feel like doing anything. Now some people, they are very lethargic. And in their lethargic, they say, I'm not lazy. I'm simply in the energy saving mode. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, you can save energy. But when we say we are using a phone and we are putting it in the energy saving mode. You know, we save energy for some purpose. Isn't it? Oh, I had to go for five hours and I have only this much battery. So let me put in the energy saver. So it's good to save energy, but saving energy is not a purpose. Saving energy is for a purpose. So yeah, we have to select what we do. But lethargy means that we just don't feel like any doing anything. And you may sometimes justify that. I don't, I don't want to do anything at all. But at that time when we feel very down, we feel depressed or lazy or lonely or whatever. So at that time, recollection means look back at times were there times when I did not feel like this? Were there times when my emotions were not as down as this? Or on a more positive note, were there times when I also felt emotionally enriched, emotionally enlivened, 
say even if you are trying to practice spiritual life we practice bhakti say we come to a temple sometimes say we are if if we are doing our chanting sometimes we start chanting and we have beads you know, with 100 liter beads in our round so when we start chanting 100 beads, what happens sometimes we feel so good while chanting we feel chanting should never end i just feel so powerful i want to keep chanting and sometimes we feel chanting never ends <laughs> it just goes on and on and on what is happening over here sometimes you know we take out the beads out of the bead bag hey instead of 108 has somebody put 1008 beads over here <laughs> you just feel like i don't feel like doing anything at all so now when that happens instead of letting that feeling dominate us recollection means think back were there times when i did not feel like this were there times when i felt felt emotionally enlivened emotionally enriched yes all of us have had times of emotional dryness and we have also had times of emotional richness we have had times when our mood is very bad we also had times when our mood is good so basically recollection means that we see beyond the immediate yes this is the way i am feeling but this is not the way i always felt and this is not the way i will always feel so when we practice bhakti what are we trying to do no the uh, prabhupad called this movement as the international society for krishna consciousness krishna consciousness means we create a habit of becoming conscious of krishna and when we become conscious of krishna then what whatever particular emotion we might be feeling at that time that emotion will still be there but we will be able to raise our consciousness upward towards krishna and as we become a conscious of krishna we start feeling some kind of peace some kind of strength some kind of serenity and as we keep doing this recollection we we consciously strive to remember the good times the good moods the emotional warmth and richness that we experience these recollections can be like our treasury see our memory on the spiritual path can be our treasury that means our by default our mind will remember the bad things that have happened to us and for everybody in life bad things have happened but if you can remember the good things that have happened to us or the very fact that we are alive right now means that there is more right than wrong in our life now whatever be your particular age there are thousands of people across the world who have died before they attained our age so if we just alive there are things which are good in our life so recollection means we use our memory in a way that it assists us rather than opposes us there are bad things that have happened to all of us in our life and if we keep remembering those bad things then we will start feeling bad but if we remember the good things that have happened in our life the good experiences that we have had then we will start feeling more positive more purposeful and our mind by default being like a child you know, the a child how it is a child you, a parent may give 100 toys to the child but the 101st toy the parent, child doesn't get the child will say mom you don't love me and the child will do a big tantrum so our mind is also like that that there are many things right in our lives but our mind latches on to that which is wrong that which is bad and it makes a big tantrum out of it but if we consciously make it a habit to recollect that which is good in our life that which is right in our life then that will give us a st- strength okay this is a bad phase but this bad phase is not going to last forever and by that recollection we can persevere so the the uh, one last example which i'll conclude this and we can have questions that when we are going through difficulties in life those difficulties are like a tunnel but our mind will make us feel 
that they are like a dungeon. And in this dungeon, I'm forever trapped. And thus, we will not be able to bear it. But by recollection, yes, it's dark now, but I remember there are bright times in my life also. And there will be bright times in the future also. So we will be able to persevere. So we need to, each one of us, maybe after this talk when you go back home, you know, write down, see we need to, to do recollection at that moment is very difficult. So write down and make that memory more accessible. Write, the write down the times when you have felt emotionally enriched. Write down the good times in your life. Write down the things that have happened right in your life. And keep that readily accessible. And that will make the memory as your, as your arsenal in the inner conflict with the unhealthy emotions. When our, we equip ourselves with our memory, with healthy memories, then even if unhealthy desires, unhealthy emotions, unhealthy memories keep coming, we won't be drowned by them. Rather, we'll create a counter current and push through them. And through the tunnel, we will eventually come to light. And not only will we come to light, but because we have pushed through it, we become stronger. Each time we resist a bad mood, what happens by that is, that bad mood's capacity to attack us weakens. And our capacity to resist it increases. And gradually by this, we'll move towards greater steadiness and greater consistency. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of how to be consistent in our life. And I spoke about how our moods can make us go to emotional extremes. Like, I can't live without this person. No, I can't live with this person. So how, do we, how can we be consistent? I used an acronym. What was it? Air. So A was association. Now, we are very social creatures. So if we want to do something consistently, our own desire might weaken because of the moods. But our desires can come not just linearly by looking at something we want to do, but also triangularly by looking at those who are pursue, pursuing that thing. So if we have association of people who are consistent, then that will give us a fillip, a impetus for ourselves becoming consistent. And I was int intelligence and intention. So our, our mind will be like a child, will be very fickle when moody. But our intelligence can be an adult. And intelligence means we understand that the mood that I'm going through are temporary. They are like when a bad mood comes up, when an unhealthy urge comes up, it's not going to be forever growing like an endlessly rising line. It's like a wave. It'll go, it'll come down. So it's like a timed arm wrestling match. If we just survive the present round, we'll resume on neutral ground. So by, by keeping our intention strong, we will be able to surf the wave instead of getting swept by the wave. And R was? R was recollection. Recollection means we need to use our memory as a weapon in the inner conflict. That means rather than remembering all the bad things that have happened, the bad moods, okay, right now I'm feeling bad, but have there times when I was emotionally enriched? Have there been good times in my life? Have good things happened to me in my life? And note them down so that they are accessible to us when we need them. And when we use that, the whole purpose of Krishna consciousness is not to just to do some rituals but to make ourselves habituated to remembering Krishna. So that even when we are going through difficulties, difficult situations or difficult emotions, the habit of remembering Krishna will raise us above those emotions and situations. And then even if we are going through a dark time, we will understand that this is not a dungeon, it's a tunnel and we can keep walking through and we will come to light. And each time we resist an unhealthy urge, a bad mood, that moves capacity to ambush us weakens and our capacity to push through it strengthens. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. So we have a few questions here. Um, if any of you would like to ask questions, just raise your hand. One of us will give you a piece of paper and pen for you to write. 
So we have three questions so far, and the first question is a very uh, acute four-year-old uh, Buwik who is here with his parents. So his question is, how can I talk to Bhagwan? <laughs> okay. Okay. How can I talk to Bhagwan? Well, you have to ask Bhagwan. <laughs> there are multiple levels. Basically, just like if somebody is a small infant, now you are a four year old, you can talk with your parents. But when you are four months old or four days old, at that time, you can't talk with your parents. Your parents see you, parents can talk with you, but you can't talk back. Because at that time, you are not grown enough. So now you have grown up, now you can talk. So similarly, just as we have grown up physically, we all can grow spiritually. As we grow spiritually, our consciousness expands. So, we will be able to talk with Krishna as we grow spiritually. Till then, we can talk with those who are connected with Krishna can talk with Krishna's devotees, learn about Krishna from them and as we connect with Krishna, as we grow in our devotion to Krishna, one day we will come to the level of talking with Krishna. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Bhavik. Again, if you have any questions, just let us know. We will be there. Uh, so the second question for today is emotions coming from the soul or mind? The second part is what is the emotion of soul? Okay, do emotions come from the soul or the mind? And what is the emotion of the soul? Okay, emotions can come from broadly three sources. Say for example, right now you are sitting and you feel uncomfortable sitting on the floor. Now, this emotion can come because physically you are uncomfortable. So sometimes, so if you see the mind is here, the body is here, the soul is here. So emotion can come from the body, it's body to the mind. Emotion can come from the mind itself and emotion can also come from the soul. So right now, it might be that some of you find it very difficult to sit on the floor. And if you feel some discomfort, then you might need to get up and find a chair to sit on. But some, we all have observed that sometimes when we are bored with something, then even small inconveniences seem unbearable. If you are just waiting, when does when, when this thing get over and I will go somewhere else? Then immediately we start feeling, this, this is so uncomfortable, I don't want to sit here. So what is happening? In that case, the, the emotion is not so much physical, it is just psychological. That means it just, it is not necessarily related to the body, it is just coming from the mind. What do you mean by coming from the mind? The mind has impressions stored within them. And there might be some physical trigger. But there is no physical uh, sufficient cause for that emotion. Like say somebody has PTSD. Now they might just hear some firecracker blowing. And they might remember, oh there was a bomb explosion over there. And they get completely uh, shaken by that. So now physically there is hardly any sufficient cause, adequate cause. But what is happening? The emotion is coming from the impression stored in the mind, primarily. So another example I could give is, say if two people are staying here and this is their uh, workplace and in between there is a drug joint. Now one of them has never taken drugs and has no interest in taking drugs. The other person has taken many times drugs. When both of them pass by, one of them, the first doesn't even notice there is a drug joint. The second, they say, oh, maybe I should take something. I should take a shot. No, I don't want to take a shot. I want to take one shot. I don't want to take a shot. Now what has happened? The physical trigger is there, but for one of them there is no impression, so there is no emotion at all. For the other there is an impression, so there is an emotion. So emotions, so emotions that arise, they can arise from the physical situations, indicating that we need to correct something, but the physical situation may not be much of a cause, but because of the impression it may come. And ultimately, do emotions come from the soul? Consciousness comes from the soul. What, do I, what is the difference between emotion and consciousness? See, consciousness is like the energy of awareness. So if there were no soul with consciousness, 
we would not experience any emotion at all. So you could imagine, say if I am sitting here, here there is a TV screen and this TV screen is showing something outside. So the mind is like the TV screen, the body and the physical world is what is seen outside and I am the observer, the consciousness. So if there is no observer, now there might be a very exciting sports match going on, but nobody will experience any emotion because there is no observer over there. So soul is the, is the conscious observer and the soul's consciousness is the energy that is coming out into the world. And when this energy comes out into the mind and through the mind into the world. So the soul has pure emotions at the spiritual level in relationship with Krishna. But most of those emotions right now are inactive. Now we are more or less spiritually inert right now. So that's why sometimes in scripture it is said we are spiritually asleep. Jeeva jago, jeeva jago. Awake or sleeping soul. So at a spiritual level it's like we are asleep. If somebody is so caught in watching a movie that they are not even aware what is happening next to them. So we are like that. We are completely hypnotized by what is being displayed on the screen and what is happening in the world. So although the soul has pure spiritual emotions, most of our present emotions are not spiritual. However, whatever emotions we experience, we experience because the soul is present and the soul's consciousness is coming into the mind or the body. So what do we do right now? Instead of worrying too much where an emotion is coming from, is it the body, is it the mind, is it the soul? We focus on where an emotion is taking us. That means if I act on this emotion, Will it lead me to do something good or something bad? So if it is leading me to do some unhealthy course of action, don't worry too much about where it is coming from. Okay, it's taking me somewhere unhealthy, better let me try to restrain it. If it is inspiring me to do something healthy, let me do it. That's the best way to process emotions. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Again, if you have any questions, let us know. We'll be happy to come by and give you a piece of paper. Um, another question again on emotions. What, which is the easiest way to control our emotions? Which is the easiest way to control our emotions? I don't think there is any one way that is the easiest. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, which is, so basically, each of us has to find out what works best for us. Because all of us have a particular body and a particular mind. And based on that, certain kind of emotions will be triggered naturally within us. So, I'll give an example to illustrate this, broadly speaking. Say, now this is the floor on which you are, some of you are sitting. Now, if this floor is inclined in this way, then water will naturally flow in this direction. Now, if you, if you decide with your willpower, water should not flow in this direction. Well, willpower is not enough. Gravity's power is much bigger. Isn't it? So, if the floor is inclined, water will naturally flow in that direction. So, just as there, there can be the inclination of the floor, we all have inclinations of the mind. And if we have particular inclinations, our emotions will naturally flow in that direction. So, now, if say there are some expensive electronic items over here, we don't want the, the uh, water to flow over there. Then what do we do? Broadly, three things. Restriction. We might build some protective wall over here. By which, although the emotion comes, but we don't let it move forward. So similarly, if we know that there is some something which triggers my emotions, say if somebody is an alcoholic and they want to give up alcoholism, and their home is right next to a bar. <laughs> then it is almost impossible to give it up, isn't it? So you have to create some barrier between them. One barrier could be distance. So if we don't want an emotion to flow in a particular direction, create some barrier, whatever it may be. Restriction is one. Second is redirection. That means you get some mop or a brush or something and push it in the other direction. And that pushing is the practice of bhakti yoga as a sadhana. It sadhana means right now it is conscientious devotional service. Conscientious, we, have, we may not feel like doing it, but with conscious intention we do it. So when we are chanting Hare Krishna, as was recommended, 
or we are worshiping the deities or we are hearing classes like this what are we doing we are consciously pushing our consciousness away from the unhealthy emotion towards krishna so that's redirection and the best way is reconstruction if you don't want water to flow this way just reconstruct the flow so that it's like this and the water will automatically flow in that direction so reconstruction is what happens by purification when we become pure by regularly when we practice bhakti we become purified and once we are purified then our inclination goes toward krishna so that is what we, when that happens then our bhakti becomes spontaneous naturally we think about krishna naturally our thoughts go toward krishna so right now how do we control our emotions we have to see what level we are at for some things the reconstruction might already have happened and even actually be moving toward krishna for some things reconstruction is far away so right now we need restriction at least let it not go in this direction and we have to find out how can i redirect so when the emotion starts going in a particular direction you know we have to we can't just say i won't do this i won't i don't i won't feel like this i won't feel like this that doesn't work very well so we have to instead of saying i won't feel like this we have to direct our emotion our thoughts our consciousness somewhere else and when we start feeling something else start feeling something in relationship with something else then we won't feel so much in this direction so we have to find out what will redirect our thoughts so for some of us it might be just deep breathing for some of us it might be chanting for some of us it might be reading and reciting some verses or some wisdom quotes for some of us it might be hearing spiritual music so we have to find out which is the bra- which is the bra- which is the mop that by which can, i can effectively push the emotions push my consciousness in a healthier direction so broadly by restriction redirection and reconstruction we can control our emotions okay thank you thank you everyone for your participation we have few more questions not sure how many we will be able to get through today but we still encourage you to give us your questions one of us rukmini or dhru will be able to collect it from you so next question is how can i bring more light into my life how can i bring light more light into my life that is by <coughs> turning toward the supreme light is by primarily turning toward krishna now what does it mean see if in every situation in our life it may be very very dark but the nature of the darkness in life is that that darkness is not just caused by externals we can either increase the inner darkness or we can increase the inner light that means each moment we can make a choice so suppose somebody is terribly sick and uh, they are bedridden so they can either think about think about oh how terribly sick i am how much pain i am in and the more we feel sorry for ourselves the more the darkness will increase within us but what can we do see all of us have the capacity to take responsibility to change our reality all of us have the capacity to take the responsibility to change our reality change our reality means okay i am sick right now i can think oh, what terrible how terribly sick i am or i can think i am grateful that this disease is curable i am grateful that i have a good doctor i am grateful that i have health insurance i am grateful that i have i have people who are supporting me i am grateful that i have krishna consciousness by which i can remember krishna and make the suffering more bearable so if we take the responsibility okay this is darkness but i will try to look at the light i'll try to connect with the light so when darkness has come around us i have a whole seminar on gratitude but simply i'll speak three things over here because i the seminar is titled ace your life with gratitude that's there on my youtube channel but ac is a it's acronym ac is look for the good around the bad a is around there is darkness 
but don't obsess on the darkness look for the good around the bad this bad thing has happened but what are the good things around it then c is counter counter means look for the good that helps you to counter the bad okay i've got this terrible disease oh, so terrible so terrible so ter okay but what 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 are the good things that help me to counter it yeah i've got i've got good treatment going on i've got good health i've got a good doctor look for the good that helps you to counter the bad and e is emerge look for the good that may emerge from the bad so if we look back at our own dark experiences in our life from the past you will see all of us we have grown through that maybe those dark experiences were what, were what were needed for us to become better stronger tougher human beings maybe those dark experiences brought us closer to krishna so if we just look at the bad that will only increase the darkness but if we take the responsibility to look for the good around the bad to look for the good that enables us to counter the bad and to look for the good that may emerge from the bad then we'll find that even amid darkness we can create light within us and we can increase the light within us thank you Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause once again to Mr. Prabhu. Thank you so much, Mr. Prabhu, once again for.